Don't know where to start building your fantasy world? Do you need more? Does it make sense? Forget any worries and become a crafter of imagination. This is the place that will help prime your mind. Now, it's time to heat up the forge, break out the mithril ingots and hammer. Welcome to the World Builder's Anvil. I'm your host, Jeffrey W. Ingram. Let's sup from the mug of Java and build. Welcome back to another exciting adventure at the World Builders Anvil. My name is Jeffrey W. Ingram. Once again, I'll be your host. And today, the topic is cultures. Cultures is one of my favorite topics in world building. It's probably the thing that spurred me to world building cultures along with maps. National Geographic was very common in my house, and I was always fascinated reading and looking at pictures of other cultures and other landscapes that weren't familiar to me. So this is a topic very near and very dear to my heart, so let's get right into it. So first of all, what do I, what do I mean when I'm talking about culture? It's probably easier to start off with what I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about a country of any form. Most countries will have at least one culture in it. There can be multiple cultures in a country. For example, you have a, sort of a southern culture, at least in the U.S. You have a northeastern culture. You have a west coast, east coast. Midwesterner. You have all these different sort of cultures in America. Maybe those are subcultures within the greater scope of America. It all depends on the scope of your story. Really depends on what you mean by culture. If you did a, a culture inside of, let's say, New York City, you'd probably have different cultural groups within there that you're dealing with. And so you kind of need to look at the scope of your story because if you build cultures from the top down into a into one city to talk about stories, you're going to have so many cultures in your world that you're never going to get the time to make the, to make the story. So, and what I think about culture in my world, I talk about cultural groups, sort of like ethnicities. However, it could be different. It's limited on the kinds of stories you want to talk about. And you'll find when I start to get into stories, you'll find there are subcultures that would really be treated as cultures when it comes to world building. Now, what defines cultures? For me, it's shared experience, it's shared symbology, shared beliefs and norms, language, religion, common food and rituals. And then, of course, art, music, and dress are things that come out of the culture but are directly representative thereof. You would not be likely to find a burqa at a Midwestern Lutheran church. It's just not going to happen. However, as you go back in time and you get into areas of the world where cultures don't co-mix as much as they do in the United States, you are more likely to see very uh, similar clothing, very similar shoes, the music, the musical instruments that are important. And those are all really a reflection of the big ones, which are the shared experiences, the shared symbology, and uh, the shared beliefs and norms. These are the things that sort of, to me, they create a culture. So when I talk about shared experience, it's from the time they're hunter-gatherers until the time they start forming into cities or into whatever more modern take on life they're moving into, they they will sit around and they will come up with these shared experiences. For example, if you're forced to migrate because of another powerful hunter-gatherer group in the area, that's a shared experience. And now over time those shared experiences are going to change. The geography you live in might not be the same when you become settled to turn into a country that you were when you started off. For example, one of the most common ones you think about in Earth are the Aryans. And and I'm not talking about the Nazi guys. There was a, a Indo-European tribe that was very big in India, but they, they kind of spread all over. And they went up probably into uh, Scandinavia. They went up into sort of Central Europe. And at the time when they were moving about, they had these shared experiences. But then over time, they lose connection with where they came from. And if there are still people who are genetically Aryan in the Middle East, they're going to have a very different looking culture because the culture itself will change over time. The shared experiences will not coexist if you have a widespread out culture. It'll end up breaking down into smaller cultures depending on people's ability to move, travel, and visit. Shared symbology. 
But in the Western world, the cross. I mean, you can't miss the cross in the Western world. It might be a crescent moon somewhere else. And those are also religious symbols. But they're also shared symbols, you know. In the West, especially traditionally, big, big things were impressive. But in the East, if you look at like, you know, some of the palaces, they're really wide. So, you know, to me, I look at that and I say, width is more important than height in Asia. But in, in, in the West, height means more. So if you have a structure that's taller, that's more meaningful than a structure that's really big just because it's wide and it takes up a lot of real estate on the ground. Share beliefs and norms. So the myths you come up with that you tell your kids that you, you explain the world, why is thunder bad or why is thunder good? How do we stop thunder from hurting us by striking us with lightning? All of those things, cultures create mythology. And mythology is, you know, a neat way that you can have fun with the culture. You can write some stories about what is the creation of. But these are the shared beliefs. These tell the people in the society how to act. Or if they want to act out, what do you do to be bad? If your culture doesn't like cannibalism, which I would imagine most don't because there's actually negative things that happen to people when they eat other people. So most cultures have this no-no about cannibalism. And one of the early ways you deal with that is you come up with stories explaining why cannibalism is bad. The stories in one cultural group will vary from a different cultural group, but they'll, they'll maybe have the same moral objective of saying, no, you don't eat your children if you're Greek. That's bad. You don't want to eat them if you're Greek or really any other race but or ethnicity, but don't eat your children. It's bad in our stories. And here's why. Here's what happens. This is why. Zeus almost destroyed the world in a flood because people tried to eat babies, even though he did it. But you can't blame him. He's the chief god. Now, language. Language is the way people speak. The words, the meaning of the sounds, which allow common communication. And as it sort of solidifies into a culture, say you will have the Latin language or you will have the Greek language. You will start having these languages that form up from much more abstract languages, you know, or abstract cultures, like in Earth, you have the Indo-Europeans, which are all over, you know, most of the world, from, I think, Malaysia all the way through Europe. But it's a certain, you know, sort of proto-culture that broke down, and they had sort of some common sounds, but then as they broke down, the alphabets ended up different. The sounds that were important to the cultures were different. And so when you get down to that level where I say hi, and I mean, hello, which <laughs> is kind of word, weird using a word, explain a word. But when you get into that level of connection with the language where you understand what someone says by the sounds that come out of their mouth or by the letters they scratch on paper or maybe by an image they flash in your head or potentially uh, from a sign in their hands or body gestures, those become cultural norms as much as any other norm in in the world so to be greek you had to speak greek if not you were a barbarian and it was that simple to the greeks now different periods of time I have different emphasis on the importance of speaking the language and at different places it would also have a different you know some places if you make money and there's a real benefit to knowing multiple languages you'll probably find in that culture there might actually be a norm to know multiple languages and you do see that in many european countries today I'm not sure how true that was 60 or 100 years ago, but today that's fairly important. Um, a lot of Europeans I've met do speak at least one language. Well, most Americans I've met, they're like, yeah, we speak a half of them. Now, uh, common food and rituals. They're the things you do in your everyday life that you don't even think about. The kinds of foods you choose. If you're choosing cheese, you're probably not from a culture that doesn't drink dairy products or eat them. Because you would probably find cheese very gross. It's mold, it's icky, it's yucky, but it, oh, I love it. It's delicious because I've always eaten. Where I'm from, cheese is huge. Uh, it's huge in many parts of the world, but not everywhere. That's a cultural decision. And I'm quite fond of my culture for choosing that one. At least I think I am because I love cheese. And food is another great way to bring detailed connections with people because everyone has to eat. So when you talk about people eating and the rituals that happen at the table, you know, is there a certain way that families sit down? That could be important for your culture. Do you have to be excused? I had to be excused from the table. Not everyone I know had to be excused. I don't even know if that's a U.S. cultural thing or not. 
It's definitely a Midwestern thing, but that could vary culture to culture as well, too. It's the little things in life, the way you enter and exit a house, the way you greet people. Do you say hello or do you say something more like, hey, have you eaten? Place that, you know, food's more important, you might have that as a question. And I believe they say that in China, you know, basically like hungry. I'll give you some food. Your cultural greetings aren't always going to mean hello or have a good part of the day. Don't feel constrained to those. Art, music, and dress. These are things that are, that come out from the culture. They're expressions from the culture. They're not so much what make the culture, but it's easy to identify people who are trying to be part of that culture by music, dress, and art. Some instruments are going to be more important in different parts of the world. Um, and that's just the way it is, the way they're used. The types of rhythms, even though rhythm and harmony and these things exist at a mathematical level, when it comes to cultures, there's certain like types of sounds that are maybe universal, but most of them are really cultural. Sounds that could really creep me out musically might have no effect on a different culture. It's just the way I've been trained to hear them and the meaning I drive when I hear them, much the way when I see an image of Count Dracula, I might be frightened. And the other thing to remember too, cultures are not fixed in time. As they have more shared experiences, you know, they run into different geographies. The world that they live in gets larger. They can see more and learn more. The things that are important to the culture are going to shift. As they come into contact with different cultures, they might take some stuff or they might become isolationist. There are going to be different types of reactions for all cultures. But the fact is, once they meet another culture, the culture is going to change. And there are some rare exceptions, like in migrations, uh, mass migrations from point A to point B. If the geography is somewhat similar, the people who move in mass, if they're not subjugated by a different conqueror, they might actually try and really stick tight to the traditions they had at the time they moved to remember back to the old country. But that's usually not the case. Usually cultures move in mass together and when they arrive to the new place, the geography there, the weather there, the food, these things are going to impact them. The cultures around there are going to impact them, and they're going to change. The writing for this is basic. You need to know the cultures of your story. Now, once again, don't get too caught up with what you mean by culture group. The scope of cultures is defined by where you're telling the story. If you're telling the story in old New York, it might be neighborhood to neighborhood. If you're telling it in Connecticut, it might be Gold Coast versus the Northwest Corner versus Central Connecticut versus Eastern Connecticut versus the shore. It's going to vary on the area you're, you're talking about the story. And you might want some of the bigger cultural information. So if you're talking about a smaller area within like a bigger culture, you want to maybe know at least some variations with cultures around. Or for example, I have a culture in my world Bodracum, and they have different ways of greeting each other if they're peasants versus nobles. And they have different, different ways of using the same language. And those come out in, in the stories. But those are some of the cultural things that can help flesh out and make it feel not so orderly, but still orderly at the same time. And, and when you look at cultures across the world, they're full of hypocrisies and they're full of good things. Don't, there's, I don't know if there's one better than another one. It's not important. The simple fact is they're all, they will all contradict themselves. And for every nine things that they do exactly the same way, there will be 10 things that they do different every time. You'll see this in language and in the way that the culture acts. The world building task for the day. If you have a list of the countries and races in your world and you use them as a culture and say, okay, if I want this kind of country with this kind of culture, let me develop the culture separately. And the benefit of this is if there's wars where the country's conquered at times, you can start taking the cultures and looking at them separate from the country. And you separate the country out and the changes to the country don't necessarily change the culture. Because, you know, if you have a, a embedded culture and they get conquered, they're not going to overnight become, when the Normans conquered England, the Anglo-Saxons didn't become Normans. And some probably did. And then over time, some Normans became Anglo-Saxons. And with all the other people who were attacking England at the time, over a period of hundreds of years, those all kind of co-turned into the English. So keep the cultures separate from your races 
in countries, and you might have countries, especially depending on where you are in the development of your world, the earlier they are, the more likely a country is going to be closer to being one culture, and maybe even a race is going to be very likely to be one culture, one country. But the longer your world's been around, the less likely that's true. It doesn't seem believable that orcs of Moria could be conquered and not change. And maybe you want your world that way. And I'm not going to argue with anyone who makes the world that way. But for me, it just does not seem plausible that cultures don't change when they interact with other cultures. The real world task for the day. Very important one here. Start taking responsibility for problems that are not your fault. If your significant other or your family member has a rough day at work, look at them and tell them, hey, I take full responsibility for that. I apologize. Sounds odd, but at least for me, dealing with my wife, it's been a very successful mechanism to, one, help defuse her bad day so she's in a better mood. And if she's in a better mood, she's more likely to let me do the work I want to do as long as my other responsibilities are taken care of. Also, sometimes when you do screw up in life, When they get used to hearing you say that it's your fault, you don't get blasted when it really is your fault as much as you might be otherwise. It's been very successful for me. I stole that from Charlton Heston who said it in an interview once. I think it's a great advice. Help them out, you know, to say, hey, it's my fault. I apologize. And you'll see their eyes will kind of short circuit because they don't know why you're taking responsibility. But over time, if you don't do that, I, I found... Like, if I go through times where I stop doing that, my wife will notice. And she's like, why don't you do that anymore? And I'm like, oh, I really, you know, I didn't think about it, but it's really worked out for me. Just try it out. Might not work for you. I'm not an advice giver for relationships. I'm just throwing out a simple task for you to do a day. If you don't find mine working for you, email me. Give me a comment on the show notes page on my website, gardool.com, and I will add those on in to my later episodes. The teas for my next episode are races. And as always, make sure to go to Garduel.com. That's G-A-R-D-U-L.com for the show notes. It'll be under podcasting, world builders, and that's a great place to get all of the information from the episode that you've just listened to and to see all the resources that we've talked about in this episode. Thanks for joining us this episode of the World Builders Anvil. Please be sure to rate and review us in iTunes, and please help get the word out to your friends about our show. And join me, Jeffrey W. Ingram at Garduel.com to see the progress of my world and learn why I made the choices I did. And please contact me and let me know the topics you would love to hear in the future. Now strike, why the myth rolls high.